Hello dear students and welcome to this series of lectures in botany and today our topic is DNA the genetic material an interesting topic indeed. While Darwin was writing the origin of species the famous book Mendel was carrying out a series of classical experiments with garden P Pisum sativum in his quite monastery garden from 1856 to around 1863 that provided useful insights about heredity and in fact marked the beginning of modern genetics. Mendel's contribution helped a lot to establish that heredity was controlled by factors what we nowadays call as genes but he called them as element T and later on chromosomes were found to be the carrying agencies for these genes or factors. Subsequently, a series of experiments yielded enough scientific proof that a magic macromolecule DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid is the genetic material. However, the Mendel's outstanding achievement was to demonstrate that inherited characters are determined by discrete factors that are passed from one generation to the next and are reassorted separately in each generation. Uh, recent evidence in molecular genetics have established beyond any doubt that pattern of inheritance of chromosomes in fact mirrors the pattern of inheritance of genetic traits described by Mendel way back in 18. 65. And in the present lecture, we will specifically address certain fundamental questions which at the end I suppose you should be able to answer. So the questions that we are going to address include first, what is DNA? Then what is the genetic material? What do we mean by it? Then the third question is how do we know that DNA is the genetic material? And fourth and very important question is which attributes of DNA in fact make it the ideal genetic material. And so for the first question is concerned what DNA is. Deoxyribose nucleic acid or DNA is indeed a magic molecule and it is in fact the single most important molecule in living cells containing all the information that a cell and of course the organism of which it is a part needs to live and to propagate itself. Natural selection has favored the evolution of double-stranded DNA with its remarkable tight helical structure and ease of unwinding, the bases of which are uh, of course protected but at the same time also available for replication. Let me just talk very briefly about the structure of the DNA. You know DNA is basically composed of the nucleotides and each nucleotide contains three parts, a phosphate group, a sugar deoxyribose and one of the four nitrogen bases. The four bases of DNA, I mean their designation and their triphosphate form so far is concerned, they include adenine which we designate as DATP, guanine DGTP, thymine DTTP and cytosine DCTP. In uh, 1950 Chargoff developed the principle of base pairing. He determined that relative amount of adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine in a variety of cells and proved that adenine is equivalent to thymine and the amount of cytosine is equivalent to that of guanine and that there is exactly as much purine that means adenines and guanine in the nucleus as there is pyrimidine that means thymines and the cytosine. Though the use of uh, X-ray crystallography, Wilkins and Franklin determined that DNA was double-stranded and could form a helix. The actual model of DNA double helix was given by, you know, Watson and Crick. In 1953, having used the critical information from the work of others such as Rosalind Franklin and Linus Pauling and by constructing models of their own. Watson and Crick determined the double helical structure of the DNA including its phosphate sugar backbone, the specific AT bonding, 
GC bonding, uh, the base pairing I mean of purines and the pyrimidines and the meaning of the intramolecular distances. And this classical model of DNA is still surviving as the giant development in the modern micro, uh, molecular biology. Since the structure of DNA is not our immediate concern in the present lecture, what we will be specifically interested in is DNA as the genetic material. So I'll come to the next question, what basically we mean by the genetic material. The genetic material of an organism is the substance that contains the information specifying the inherited characters or characteristics of the organism. And this genetic information must be stable. It must be capable of being expressed in the cell as and when it's needed. It also must undergo accurate replication. And of course, it should be transmitted in a largely unchanged form. As you know, while most of the organisms use universally DNA as the genetic material, there are certain exceptions. Certain bacteriophages, plants, and animal viruses, they utilize RNA as the genetic material. An interesting question now is, which attributes of DNA make it the ideal genetic material? You know, over the years, as the physical and biochemical properties of genetic material became more and more clear, a suite of characteristics of DNA was found to make it a perfect genetic material. And most important of these characters include that DNA has the ability to store genetic information, which can be expressed in the cell as and when needed. Very, very important characteristic. And the second important thing is DNA can undergo a special mode of replication, what we call as semi-conservative mode of replication, which facilitates transmission of its genetic information to daughter cells with minimal possible error. This process of replication and transmission involves a complex machinery of enzymes and repair mechanisms. Then the third important characteristic is, that makes DNA as the perfect genetic material, is that DNA possesses enough physical and chemical stability, thereby ensuring that the genetic information, which is of course present in it in duplicate, is not lost over a long period of time. And one more important characteristic is that DNA has the potential for heritable change without major loss of parental information. And each of these attributes of DNA contributes significantly to its ability to function as a perfect genetic material. The interesting question again is, how do we know that DNA is the genetic material? What is the proof that we have? In fact, demonstration of DNA as the genetic material is an interesting story, and it resulted from a series of uh, classical experiments. Uh, the first classical experiment that you quite often must be seeing also in your textbooks is a puzzling observation of transformation by Frederick Griffith in the course of his experiments on the bacteria uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae in 1928 which was followed by another important demonstration of DNA as the transforming agent in 1944 by Oswald Avery, MacLeod, and M. McCarty. And the important experiment again after that was the establishment of DNA rather than proteins or other things as the genetic material in 1952 by another very interesting experiment of Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase in a classical uh, experiment on the phage virus T2 particles. I will talk about these classical experiments in some detail. So for the first transformation experiment by Frederick Griffith in 1928 is concerned. In fact, in 1928, this person, Frederick Griffith, who was an English army doctor in fact, he wanted to make a vaccine against a bacterium named Streptococcus pneumoniae, which caused a type of pneumonia in human beings, but is uh, normally lethal in mice. Though he failed in making the vaccine he uh, was targeting, but he eventually stumbled on the demonstration of the transmission of the genetic instructions 
by a process what we now call as the transformation principle. Indeed, an important finding. And Grift used two strains of this bacterium that are distinguishable by the appearance of their colonies when grown in the laboratory cultures or laboratory medium. In one strain, a normal virulent type strain, which is the cells are enclosed in a polysaccharide capsule, thereby giving it or giving colonies a smooth appearance. Hence, the strain is labeled as S, S for smooth. And in the other strain, which is a mutant non-virulent type that grows in mice but is not lethal, the polysaccharide coat is absent, giving colonies a rough appearance. This strain is called R strain, R, R for rough, I mean. Thus, the R bacteria, you know, is uh, the harmless, but the S bacterium is the, uh, which we inject into the mice, it causes death, so it is a virulent strain. So for the demonstration of this bacterial transformation by Griffith is concerned, it was a result of few consecutive steps. What he did in the first experiment was, when he injected mice with the S strain of this bacterium, mouse died. Second, when he injected the mouse with the R strain, mouse survived. The third thing, when the mouse was injected with the heat killed S strain, virulent strain, mouse survived again. Now, a very important another observation was when mouse was injected with a mixture of heat killed S strain and live or stray, mouse died. Why so? Question is, what happened that made mice to die when it was injected with a mixture of heat killed S strain and live or strain? The reason is that the heat killed S strain somehow transforms the R strain into a virulent one. If you see in this experiment, the parts A, B, and C, of course, they act as the control for the last demonstration that uh, shows transformation. Well, we know now transformation did take place in this experiment, but the question important that remained was, what basically is the transforming factor? And this was unraveled by the team of uh, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty in 1944, uh, more than, I think, 16 years after. Uh, the team of these scientists, Oswald, Avery, C. M. McLeod, and M. McCarty, they revisited Grip's experiment and attempted a more reliable experiment. What they did was they extracted different suspected substances or molecules, including DNA, proteins, or other things which uh, were found in the debris of the dead S cells of the Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, purified them and tested them for transforming ability one by one, I mean one at a time. And for their experiments, they used a test tube assay instead of the mice. They mixed our bacteria with these different materials and only those mixed with DNA were transformed into S bacteria thereby substantiating the fact that the transforming factor basically is the DNA. These tests showed that the polysaccharides themselves do not in fact transform the rough cells. Therefore, the polysaccharide code, although undoubtedly concerned with the pathogenic reaction, is only the phenotypic expression of the virulence. Now, in screening the different groups Avery and his colleagues found that only one class of molecule, DNA, induced the transformation of our cells. 
They in fact deduce that DNA is the agent that determines the polysaccharide character and hence the pathogenic activity or character of the organism. It seemed that providing our cells with S-DNA was tantamount to providing these cells with the S genes. So the message that we get from this experiment was, I mean, this experiment demonstrated that DNA is in fact the transforming principle. And it was the first demonstration that genes are composed of DNA in a way. And after this, a quite interesting experiment was that of the Hershey and Chase, which in your textbooks also is known as a classical Hershey Chase experiment, which was conducted by, uh, you know, in fact, the experiments conducted by Avery and his colleagues were, of course, definitive, but many scientists at times were reluctant to accept DNA rather than proteins as the genetic material. Uh, the clincher was therefore provided by 1952 by Alfred Hershey and Amartya Chase with the use of the Farge virus particles. What they did was they had reasoned that Farge infection must entail the introduction or injection into the bacterium of the specific uh, information that dictates viral reproduction. You know, viruses, when they in, uh, infect bacteria, they overtake their machinery for the replication. And in this experiment, what they did, the phage is, you know, relatively simple in molecular constitution. Most of its structure is the protein, with DNA contained just inside the protein sheath of this head. The Hershey Chase experiment, which demonstrated that genetic material of phage is DNA, not proteins or any other thing used two sets of T2 bacteriophages. In one set, the protein coat was labeled with the radioactive sulfur, S35, not found in DNA. In the other set, the DNA was labeled with radioactive phosphorus, P32, not found in proteins. Only P32 was injected into the E. coli, indicating thereby that DNA is, in fact, the agent necessary for the production of new phages. And the conclusion from this experiment is, is almost inescapable. We cannot escape from the conclusion, which says that DNA is basically the hereditary material. The phage proteins are mere structural packaging that is discarded after delivering the viral DNA into the bacterial cell. Now, these experiments establish beyond doubt that DNA is the genetic material. And being the genetic material, it has to have certain important characteristics, which I made a mention before also. Now, one of the important characteristics of DNA to act as the ideal, ideal genetic material is the, you know, its capacity to store and transmit the genetic information. Well, the flow of information contained in uh, sequences of DNA bases takes place through two important processes, transcription and translation. Transcription is the process of synthesizing RNA molecules, messenger RNA molecules, as you must be knowing, from a DNA template, followed by translation, the process of protein synthesis from mRNA, which comprises the, in fact, these two processes, they comprise the central dogma of molecular biology. In fact, DNA possesses and conveys several types of information required in this central dogma. And these include that DNA possesses and conveys information about the sequences of all RNA molecules synthesized by the cell. B, it conveys information about the sequence of all amino acids in every protein synthesized by the cell. Then, it's the start and the stop signals of the synthesis of each RNA and each proteins are contained in it. Then a set of signals that interacts with the cellular component and determines whether and when a particular RNA or a protein is to be made and how many molecules are to be made per unit time, this information is also there. Then signals that serve as origins and uh, terminators of the replication of DNA, they are also contained there very important factor is also the signals that provide essential features of chromosome structure, including the centromeres and the telomeres, they are also uh, contained in DNA itself. And you know, DNA is the 
agency of tr transmission of information from parents to the progeny. And for this, genetic information is transferred from parents to progeny organisms by faithful replication of parental DNA molecules, which is, as I told you earlier, also a complicated process, not even yet completely understood. Though we have made certain, I mean, many advances in the molecular genetics in the recent times. Moreover, the degree of accuracy required for DNA replication is much higher than for uh, transcription and as such cells have you know, developed additional mechanisms to ensure this precision and uh, correct uh, you know, transmission. The enzymes involved in the DNA replication possess an editing and proofreading system which in fact rejects the correctness of the nucleotides and removes about 99.9 percent .9 of few errors made in the initial insertion. Besides, the cells have evolved mechanisms to differentiate the newly synthesized DNA strain from the older parental strain. Special enzymes monitor the DNA at all times, looking for mismatched base pairs. Any mismatch, if somehow creeps in, is corrected using the older DNA strand as a template. And this combination of error correcting mechanisms reduces the copy error rate in DNA duplication in cells to between, say, 1 in 10 raised power 9 and 1 in 10 raised power 10 base pair. Means very low possibility of transmitting an error. A very important factor for DNA to act as an ideal genetic material, you must know, is its stability also. Stability of DNA as a genetic material, so far is concerned, it is important for two important reasons. One, for long-lived organisms, it has to last for more than 100 years or even more. And second, the information contained in DNA molecules is passed over succeeding generations over millions of years with only small change. And the stability of DNA is in fact imparted by number A, extremely stable sugar phosphate backbone. The carbon-carbon bond in the sugar are uh, resistant to chemical attacks under all conditions except strong acids uh, at very high temperatures. The second reason is the bases themselves, except for cytosine of course, are very stable. And the third important reason is that the double helical structure of DNA provides the bases with hydrophobic rings with a great protection against chemical attacks. The hydrophobic structure of the bases causes them to stack so tightly that water is almost completely excluded from the stacked array. And this keeps at bay all water soluble compounds or molecules to reach hydrogen bonded charge groups and create any problems or disturbance there. Now, at last I will also talk about a very important aspect of DNA acting as a genetic material, an ideal genetic material, is that its ability of DNA to change through mutation and contribute to the process of evolution. Since uh, DNA is the sole storehouse of the genetic information, its base sequence must have provision for change if the organisms have to evolve through time. The base sequence in DNA may change by mutation, which is the nucleotide, I mean at the nucleotide level this mutation may take place through two principal mechanisms. One is the chemical alteration of the bases, second is the replication error by which an incorrect base is erroneously incorporated or an extra base is accidentally inserted or deleted in the daughter molecule. And from this all discussion, the conclusion that we can draw or the key learning points for us are that yes, DNA is a genetic material and there is enough evidence both direct and indirect to prove that DNA is indeed the genetic material. The three classical experiments 
that I made a mention of proved beyond any doubt the role of DNA as the genetic material. Then the second important thing is that DNA has evolved as the ideal genetic material because it is especially well suited for replication, repair, occasional change, and long-term stability. Moreover, DNA as a genetic material provides provision for organisms to evolve in response to various selection pressures through desirable mutations. That means DNA fulfills all the important criteria to act as a perfect genetic material. And that was all that we had to talk about uh, this topic, DNA as a genetic material. To talk about other aspects of DNA, we will see you in the next lecture. Till then, goodbye.